Good morning. This message, I, I, whew, there's that right there. Um, I've been nervous since yesterday, which isn't typically like, like I get kind of like a little nervous and then the morning of I get um, typically some nervous, but I've been like, I think I'm going to throw up like <laughs> that nervous and that's not normal. Um, I'm thankful. Um, Pam prayed over me this morning because I walked in. I was like, I think I'm going to throw up. She goes, what? <laughs> and I was like, I'm so nervous. And I'm typically not like that. It doesn't usually get that bad. Um, I think it's just the weightiness of this. I think it's one of those things that um, God had a plan that I didn't anticipate. And it's even being shaped. I, I say at the end of it, most of the time when I speak, I'm shocked with what comes out of my mouth just as much as you guys are. Like, Things come out, and I'm like, wow, that was really good. Like, you guys don't even know that's what's going through my mind in that moment. And so um, so today we're going to approach very difficult um, topic, which a lot of times is what a lot of people avoid. And so God's like, you're the counselor. You get to do it. And I'm like, that's great. Um, so today we're going to start in Genesis chapter 6 and I'm actually this Sunday, each Sunday, you never know what I'm going to read out of. Um, I'm reading out of the NLT um, this week. So we are going to start with Noah, and then we're going to go to Cain and Abel, because, you know, that's not fun enough. We want to add some more, and then we're going to see where the Lord takes us this morning. So I'm truly honored and blessed to be able to just be up here and, and share God's heart. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness towards us. And Lord, I just pray right now that you just prepare our hearts to receive the words that you have for us and the things that you want to speak to us. May we be willing to just be open um, for just the movement that you want to do within us. And I praise you and I thank you so much, Lord, for your faithfulness towards us and how good and loving and kind that you are. And we just lift up this time to you in your son's name. Amen. So my number one goal and heart as we begin to go through this at the end is that we would understand God's heart, that we would understand the depth of love that he has in, in an area that often gets brought up as like struggle of people like, well, if your God's so good and loving, do you remember what happened back? And we hear that a lot. A lot of people bring that up. A lot of people struggle with that moment. And I think for me personally, the understanding of the depth of God's love when it comes to this time, when it comes to Genesis chapter 6, was when I became a counselor. And for those that don't know, I specialize in two things. I specialize in complex trauma, which means it's those recovering from lifelong trauma. So let's say multiple times of abuse, it could be all different types. Just life has just hit in wave after wave after wave. And then the other thing I specialize in is couples. And I always say, because marriage is traumatic. And that's my joke. Um, but those are the two areas that I work in all the time. And so in becoming a counselor and thinking back to some of my first cases of working with complex trauma, I can tell you by the end, I wanted to flood the earth too. And that's when things began to shift, and I began to understand the depth of God's love. So we're going to dive into Genesis chapter 6. We're going to keep it real light this morning. It says, Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 100 years. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was free he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, 
I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them, but Noah found favor with the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have destroyed. I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive and be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as, as God had commanded him. Now we're going to jump to Genesis 4. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, So I love, <laughs> with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. I just think she must have been so excited. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain present, presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master." One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you. No matter how hard you work, from now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. The reason why I go from one to the other is because in that one, we kind of get to see a glimpse of God's heart and the reality of sin. Because it said that his blood cried out. And then we jump and, you know, and there's like a warning in there to like, be careful. Because sin crouches at the door and then we fast forward Two chapters over, I know there were some years in between, but two chapters over, and it's taken over the whole earth. That evil has consumed everything. And there was only one righteous man. I think about that. Like, I pause and really think. Because, see, just in this room alone, I mean, we have, we have some few, right? But one, there was one man that had favor with the Lord over everybody on the whole earth at that time. That to me is mind blowing. I can't even begin to fathom. And even the fact that he, Noah himself, held tight. That he had this relationship between him and the Lord and that he held on to it. That's huge. That's not easy. Not at all. 
everywhere around you is corrupt and evil and darkness and self and pain. And you're the only one. And to stand strong in that. But then we sit here and it's very quick and easy. This is when we begin to look at, gosh, God's so angry. Gosh, God's so mean. Gosh, I can't. And all of those things. And we miss the fact that no, he's loving. When, when a person dies, it says the blood cried out. God could hear it. He could hear the pain that had been inflicted. And his heart was moved. And the same thing happens in Genesis chapter 6. He couldn't handle it. It makes me think, if the whole world is dark, you're, there's only one righteous guy, how much crying out could you handle? If you could hear all the pain just crying out to you, the worst things, the worst things that we turn our face from because we can't even handle. I can't tell you how many people go, that makes me uncomfortable. So they turn their TV off or they shut their Facebook off or they turn away or they silence somebody or they shut themselves down. But God hears it all. His whole heart hears all of it, all the weeping, all the crying, all the pleading, all the evil thoughts, everything just sitting there, and it just comes louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And And eventually love goes, enough. I can't take it anymore. I can't handle hearing all these things. I created them and look at what they've done with the earth that I've handed them. Look at what they've done. We go back to when I shared the first message about the garden and you know it grieved God's heart when he walked out and they were not, he couldn't find them. Something had changed. They had made a decision. They had turned their back. And you look and he has more than just Adam and Eve. He has more than just Cain and Abel. He has all of these people and he hears all of the pain all of the wickedness, all of it. So this is where the counselor part of me comes out. Well, why doesn't he just, we could just give a list of things. But I don't think anybody fully realizes to the full extent that trauma has on the brain and the full extent that is needed for healing. There's no savior. There's no Holy Spirit. There's none of that. None of that. And there was only one righteous man. And see, I know this because I know that healing comes through connection. Who are they going to connect with? How are they going to find healing? They've come so far away, like far. Let's keep walking. From who God is, what he had created them to do. They had moved far away from that, so far And his heart is so grieved and so pained by all of it. I just want to like pause, let that sink in. One righteous man, all is evil, blood cries out, you hear every thought, everything. And everything about you is love. Everything about you is love. You couldn't take it. I can tell you, I just hear one case at a time in a day. I can't even take it. I can't tell you how many tears I've shed just hearing people's stories and what they've walked through and the pain that's been inflicted on them and what they've had to experience. And then I know that it's a road to healing. It's a long road. And then that's if all the factors are in place and they're surrounded by love and connection. They have all the things that they need. And then they might stand a chance, but they spend their whole entire life trying to recover from the trauma of their childhood or the things that have happened to them. It makes you cry. I cannot tell you how many people I have come home and I have wept over, and I'm not sorry about that because somebody needed to shed the tears over their life because they were worth it. They were that important that I know the Lord sheds his tears over their life and his heart is broken because we see it. We see in scripture the blood cried out. It had continued to go. God couldn't take it. Love can't handle it. Love goes, enough. Let's just make it stop. I hear all of their pain and I can't handle it anymore. And he just, he's like, I can't do this. And that's why I believe in the belief that that water was his tears to the extent because his heart was so broken because of what had happened.
So is he angry and mean? Or is he loving and kind? And that is my prayer this morning, is that every person who hears this, every person that sees this would be moved, that God weeps when they weep. He hears the blood that cries out. He hears everything. He hears it all, and he can't, his heart is crushed. And he understands the reality that it feels like there's no hope, and it's just consumed with darkness. And he gets it. And that's why he said enough. I can't do this anymore. So now we ask, what do we do? (laughs) And that's where there's hope. That's where we have lots of hope. Because sometimes we forget the impact that one person filled. Because see, things have changed since all of this time. We all know how the story continues after that. The flood ceases, the, the waters pull back, and all of those things. And then we fast forward years later, and then we have a Savior, and it doesn't even stop there. God loves us so much. We have Acts chapter 2. He comes And he lives and dwells within us again. And the reason why my heart behind this message for all of us, one, if you've been through something, I want you to know that the Lord loves you so much. And he weeps with your pain. And he is grieved with your sorrow. So much so that his tears filled the whole entire earth. That is how much. But then the second thing is to realize the impact that we bring by influencing the culture around us. And that if we do not do so, so we're going to jump to Jude. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now that I find, now I find that I must write about something else urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live in moral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, Though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the internal fire of God's judgment. I just want to pause there because we hear judgment instantly and think, oh, see, there he is again, that word. But it's, I look at it as a refining fire, like the pureness of love. Like if you were to walk through it and the reality of where your heart is, would you make it on the other side? Or would you poof? Because of the extent of selfishness that consumes. Because that's what we're talking about. Everything about who God is is love. Everything he designed is love. Every bit of when we talk about the Ten Commandments all revolve around God's love for us. He's like, hey, this is how love works. This is what it looks like. It means we don't go kill each other. It means that we're kind. It means that we're truthful. It means that we worship me because I'm the one that made you because I love you, not because I'm narcissistic and everybody's got to say my name. No, because connection with me is what you were made for. 
So when we hear the word judgment, let's just think about the pureness of all love. Could you walk through that and come out on the other side? Because that's what it means. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live in moral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. I have to drink some water. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them. And so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them, for they fall in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money. And like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They are like wild waves of the sea churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to black as darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen. The Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of, the, of all the ungodly things they have done for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and complainers living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this, you will keep yourself safe in God's love and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. And that's where our warning is, is to be careful because we're in a time where it is, it is so difficult and it is quick to want to react to the things that we see, to want to just say things. But we don't realize that many people don't understand the extent of God's love. Many people don't understand how to be raised in the ways and within God's design. And that's where we come in. The church is the place where you just bring them in and they begin to enter. And it's like, I feel like they're ping ponging around the, the love pinball, you know, and they're just like going along and just being filled and transformed as they encounter and so if we withhold ourselves from culture, if we withhold ourselves from bringing impact, then how are they ever going to learn? How are they ever going to be influenced? Whatever is going to happen? Because see, we already saw the reality of how quickly things can go downhill if we don't hold our ground. But we don't hold our ground by controlling people. We hold our ground by loving them with truth, by living it out, by not compromising, not justifying, not getting pulled away into all the lies that are saying, hey, you can do this. Hey, you can do that. And I'm not going to list them all. Hey, you can go over here. Hey, you can go over here. It's fine. It's not. It's a trap. And it's not because God is mean. It's not how he designed us. And it's not love. And it's devastating. 
I cannot tell you the way my heart is when I looked at when I look at everything all the time. Those that know me know I cry. I'm like, oh my gosh, they don't understand their identity. They don't understand who God is. They don't understand the love that he has. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And that's when we bring them in, wherever they're at. We invite them in the doors, and we just let them sit around, and we love them. Because connection is healing. And we are in a time where the whole earth isn't going to be flooded because the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us. Now we have the Savior that has come and died and resurrected. So there's power and authority now. Love can just begin to just tidal wave all throughout the earth. But we have to realize who we are, where we are, is important. We bring impact. We bring influence. That smile, that kindness, that word, that meeting people exactly where they are, not trying to change them, but just loving them and letting God just flow through and we're just his vessel. And we just get to be a part of what he's doing. That's life changing. Just even as I say that, I think about the amount of people that I have gotten the opportunity to encounter to go all the way down to the core of, well, why, does, why do you think God doesn't exist? Let's talk about that. I can't tell you how many times, I, and it breaks my heart when people say it. I mean, I take it as a compliment, but it breaks my heart. They'll look at me and go, you're the first person that will ever take the time to talk to me. I'm like, really? And this isn't just because I'm a counselor. It's how I am all the time. I think about neighbors that I've had that are not living the life that any of us would like, that I've stood out on their driveway and got to know them. And we just talked. We began to have deep heart-to-heart discussions about their life and hearing their story and just the influence that begins to have over time. And they're just drawn in and things begin to change and shift. And they don't even know that I'm undercover, that I'm here, assigned by the Lord, divinely placed by his hand. Because it's that simple. Things are dark because guess what, guys? We're not standing. We are hiding under a bushel. We all know how that goes because we're all saying that one. Under under a bushel. Oh, no. Like, I'm going to let it shine. Like, we've got to bring it out. And we've got to bring influence wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, whoever we see. And we've got to be willing to step out more and more and more into things that are incredibly uncomfortable. And God's stretching me in new ways lately that are incredibly uncomfortable. (laughs) But he's not letting me get away with it. He's not. There have been times lately he's called me to pray for people, and I'm like walking away, and I'm like, he's like, turn around, I'm like, hey, so, (laughs) strangers. But it's their willingness to be stretched. And guess what? My heart is moved by God's love so much in my life that I know I can't continue to walk away. That there's an assignment in front of me. I don't understand it. Everybody that's close to me knows. I'm like, I don't even know. I remember one lady, I go, hey, can I pray for you? She goes, yeah, I don't have a house. I'm like, we had to start small. Okay. (laughs) It does like... I was just like, I walked away so overwhelmed. I just like wanted to just sit there and cry with her. And I was like, did it even, I I just want to go get her house. I don't have a house, you know. But it's understanding those moments in obedience that I don't know what the effect that day my prayer had on her. I'll never see her again. I have no idea. But I know who God is and I know he's faithful. And I know that every person that's entered my life on God assignment has impacted me. So it's going to have an impact in some way. I'm just being obedient. I'm just influencing, influencing the world around me, the people, my neighbors, whoever's in front of me, my children, my workplace. I'm bringing his love everywhere I go. And I don't need to go around and fix everybody. I don't. I just stand in obedience, meeting people exactly where they're at, wherever they're at. And I just build relationship and have connection with them and get to know them and hear their story 
And I don't know about you, but I love stories, obviously, but I do. I'm like, tell me about you. Who are you? And just to listen and to take in their world, it is so impactful. And then God begins to show up because then you find your heart being moved and you like find this love starting to just pour out of you towards that person and you think about them again. That lady that I told you I prayed, I've thought about her, I can't tell you how many times. I think I prayed for her the whole way home. Who knows? She probably has a mansion now. Like, I don't even know, but it's just like, but my heart was moved and I have not forgotten her. And I know that there's power in my prayers and connection with the Lord. So who knows what ripple effect has had in her life. But you know what? I am thankful for God's faithfulness. And I'm thankful for his goodness that he would just send me to go and hug and pray. So I think about each one of you. What is your sphere of influence? It doesn't matter what it is. What is it? Who are the people that God has assigned in your life? Have you looked around lately? Have you, have you looked? See, is it you? Is it you? Because I also tell you, you have to be on assignment because Jesus passed by places too. He was like, no, you ain't ready. And he just kept on walking. He wasn't mean. He just did. And so that's where it's assignment, because a lot of times we've, we fall into this want to control, but it's not a person's time. It's not where things are at yet. We just got to pass on by the village, give them a cookie and smile. Like, just keep going. Like, we don't need to force people, but our lives are going to be greatly impactful when this is flowing through us. But we have to be careful, because the enemy is looking every which way to mess up your life. He is constantly to discourage you, to distract you, to overwhelm you, to, hey, come this way, hey, come this way, all the time, because that doesn't stop. And that's where we have to hold tight to each other. We have to, like, if you don't see somebody here, you better text them and call them. Be like, hey, I've missed your face. I love you. We have to hold tight to each other. And then as more people are added, we just link arms even more and our circle gets bigger. But we have to hold tight to each other. We are a family. I see your faces. I pray for you. I think about you all the time. No, I'm not stalking any of you. But may all of our hearts be moved like that. So when people enter into here, they get ping-ponged around and all the love that's happening in this room. Because we're not going to allow divisions among us. I'm going to tell you, I'm not. I pray over this space. I pray for protection over our leadership. I pray for protection over this home. I pray for protection over our body. I pray for all of those things. I look at them. I know how quickly, how quickly takes one second, boom. Link arms. So when people come in here, it's just a ping pong of love all around the room. Wow, I've never been in a place like this. Wow. Hi. You know, just love pouring out. But may we influence culture. May we understand God's heart fully. So now you have a place to start next time somebody even asks you about the hard questions. You can take them here. No, this is God's heart. It's not because he's mean. He couldn't take it anymore. And when I share that story with people, they're like, wow, I never thought about it like that. I'm like, I know, because the enemy distorts everything. Because you're thinking God's evil and me. No, he loves. And we have to influence. And we have to love. He didn't reject us. We rejected him. Remember that. I don't know why I feel led to share Mark chapter 9, verse 23. We'll see what happens. It's not planned. Well, I'm going to start in verse 21. There's more before that, but you can go back and read it if you want. It says, Jesus says, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. 
Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that made boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. They always like to whisper. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Two things that stood out in that. One, my prayer is that eyes and ears would be open, that we can hear and receive, and two, that we would be prayed up, that we would step out filled with that boldness, because a lot of times we get discouraged because we're like, nothing happened. And the Lord's like, because we don't ever hang out. It's like trying to be charged and you're never plugged in. But that powerful things begin to happen when we are connected deeply with the Lord Power just starts to pour out on all sides all the time. People start to be impacted. I'm seeing it in my own life because I've just started to challenge the Lord in a few things, but we've been quiet about it. And I'm starting to watch the Lord do things that I didn't even think were possible with myself where I'm like, wow. Like, I'm just like, oh my gosh. But it's been by the connection that God and I have been having together. It's been my secret quiet time of prayer, of challenging, of going, wait. And things are just beginning to flow through my life as we have those quiet conversations. And so if you sit in unbelief about the impact that you can have or the things that the Lord can do with you, I encourage you to sit there because the longer you're plugged in, power just starts to pulsate through your body as you're connected with the Lord and powerful things begin to happen. And you find that you have the boldness to go, hey, can I pray for you? Because It is the Holy Spirit moving and living within me. Stay connected to him. Stay connected. If you struggle with that, I say it every week. I'm just praying one week somebody's going to come and be like, I struggle with that. Because I know that there's somebody is. Because for some reason he has me say it every time I share or anything. If you struggle with that, ask. I have a testimony. I did not come out like this. Not at all. I did not have boldness. I was the shyest child who hid behind my mother's leg. I know nobody can believe it, but it was true. And then my life was filled with just horrendous stuff. The enemy's been trying to take me out since the time I came. But it has been through the power and the connection between me and the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling within me and the connection that I stay with him. And I've turned into one of those three-hour prayer people that I used to laugh at. Like, it just, I can't get enough. And my prayer is that your life is the same. Not that you have to pray three hours. The more it turns into, you're like, oh, man, I got to go to work. This is so cool. Like, you just don't want to get up because you're so overtaken by how good he is. It's extended. I mean, it started out as five minutes I used to sleep with my devotional under my pillow. I'd pull it out before the kids came up. I'd be like, okay, I think we can make it. You know, and it's just like, and it's grown and grown and grown and grown over time. But there's power as we stay connected. It's exciting.